Welcome to the Elite Recruiter Podcast with your host, Benjamin Mena, where we focus on what it takes to win in the recruiting game. We cover it all from sales, marketing, mindset, money, leadership, and placements. Hey guys, uh, I'd like to welcome you guys to the next episode of the Elite Recruiter Podcast. I have uh, Gavin Johnson, who is a top biller over in the EU based out of Belgium. Uh, welcome, Gavin, to this podcast. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you for having me. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, kind of like your background. I know you, you've done like a lot of tech recruiting. I know you've done uh, a lot of freelance, internal, external. Uh, let's start off by like, how did you get into recruiting? And let's kind of talk about where you've gone with it. Good question. Um, I, I got into recruitment. Um, I, I'd worked for like 15 years before getting into recruitment. And oh, wow. <laughs> um, I, I sort of hopped around a bit different things and I was getting a bit bored. And I was looking around and everybody said to me, Gavin, you've got to go into sales. And I was like, I don't have any background in sales. I don't know what to do, <laughs> where to start. And then a, a friend of mine said, my brother is going to start a new recruitment agency. And he's looking for people. And I go, yeah, but I can't do that. And, <laughs> and now you've got to understand, Benjamin, I knew two things about recruitment. The first thing was temping, which I don't know if you've got in the US, but it's like call center agents and things like that. Yeah. And then yep. the other thing that I knew was my mum used to work for Aegon Zender. Now, Aegon Zender, okay. are a, well, they're, they're what for me is a real headhunter. They're the guys okay. that when Coca-Cola needs a new CEO, they go to them, right? <laughs> okay, so kind of like the corn fairy over here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so for me, that was recruitment. And so in any case, I went to sit one afternoon beside my friend's brother. And I, I was amazed. And I thought, yeah, that sounds good. Let's try it out. <laughs> Seven, 17 <laughs> years later, I'm still, I'm still in recruitment. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, it, you're right. Kind of I, I, I started it, working in, in an agency. Um, I did 14 years in an agency, and then I thought, let's see what it's like somewhere else, because I'd also been headhunted. Um, so I went to work in okay. London. Um, same niche, but more responsibility. I that was not a good success, unfortunately, but I stayed there for a year. <laughs> And then I wanted to actually leave because I I moved around a lot before and I thought it's time to do something different. And I thought one thing I've never done is HR. Maybe I can get into a role as an internal recruiter, more on the HR okay. side. So um, I did that. But during this whole period, I had my ex-clients and my ex-candidates coming to me saying, Gavin, we need you. Please don't go away. <laughs> and so that's a good problem to have. Well, yeah, I couldn't complain. I couldn't complain. <laughs> but then I, um, I did a first three-month gig um, hiring customer service agents for this organization uh, here in Brussels. And I thought, yeah, okay, it's not exactly the same pace as working in an agency. And then I just basically continued doing that. Now, in parallel to that, I also was working with somebody that I'd met on holiday doing business consulting. So going in and helping organizations be better. And actually, if you put all that together, that was me busy full time. And so since then, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then since then, I've done, um, I've done a few more gigs as a freelance in-house recruiter just to get a bit more experience there. Okay. And I basically run my own one-man show doing recruitment. It's what you guys in the U.S. call staffing. So I okay, place yeah. freelance IT specialists on assignments. And I'm in a luxury position because I haven't had to do any business development since 2014. Nice. <laughs> and, so, and so basically... Yeah, I mean, what can I say? It's I, I'm I'm just living off that for the time being. Um, oh, I've got a there's a visitor at the back. Can you see that? Yep, my I, I locked my two visitors out. <laughs> 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 yeah, normally, uh, but, um, if you want to get last. Yeah, no, and uh, so sorry. 
I was going to say, if you want to get laugh, I normally like do the podcast interviews in the afternoon and at three o'clock on the dot, my, my cat will start banging on the door. Like when I'm in the middle of a podcast interview, <laughs> I'm just like, click away. <laughs> oh Ooh, yeah. You're going to be careful and time it right. <laughs> I mean, luckily it's like, so, it yeah. like going through the headset. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. No, I mean, um, the interesting thing is, of course, I've, I've had times because uh, because I know my market so well, I don't need to do all this business development. And so that's why now I'm looking at starting a, uh, a training. I want to launch an online training platform for recruiters and teach them, well, what I've been taught and how I work. Because if I can help people do recruitment without having to do any BD after a while, I'm sure there's going to be a few takers out there. Oh, I, I mean, absolutely. Is there a large market for freelance IT professionals in the EU? Yeah. Yeah, it's massive. Um, I mean, but actually, it's massive for all kinds of recruitment. Okay. Uh, there is, to, to give you an idea, the last assignment I did as an in, internal recruiter, um, so this was a large organization. There were 30 recruiters, 16 were freelance. So you can imagine already okay. the size of the thing. There are 1,200 vacancies to be filled. And then at oh, some wow. stage, they asked me <laughs> to look for another recruiter. And I mean, Belgium, Belgium is my new, right? It's got the population of New York. Yeah. But I did a okay. search. I spent, I spent one day doing a search on other freelance recruiters. And I came up with over 80 people who are freelance recruiters just in little Belgium. So there's an enormous demand there. And one of the things that- It's crazy. (laughs) Well, yeah, yeah. And actually the funny thing is, is that the market is less mobile than you guys have in the US. Because you guys move around much faster. You've got much shorter notice periods than we have here in Europe. And yet it's it's the way of getting promotion. So anybody that's a bit good and that wants to move up and increase their salary, they're on the market. Okay. And so, but to give you an idea why also I think there are a lot of recruiters is that it's it's dominated by people from the UK. And the the sort of the the British recruitment school, um, I mean, I went into a niche, which was a French speaking uh, market in my area, in my niche. And there wasn't really anybody in there locally. It was all Brits competing because of of our approach, which is we really focus on the candidates. If you know your candidates, you are going to bring an added value to your client because you know in which circumstances they can work. You know what their added value is. You know what their, their background is. And so I I worked with about, I mean, to this day, I have less than 600 candidates that I work with. Oh, wow. When I hear these people having problems on LinkedIn, where they go, I've been blocked because I've sent over 100 requirements this week. I'm thinking, wow, I've sent 100 requirements, uh, what, demands for contact in the last, I've got I've got less than 4,000 contacts on LinkedIn. Oh, wow. And, and yet I could make... Not every year, but most years, I could not now because I'm, I'm working one day a week on recruitment. But when I was doing this full time, a million dollars a year was was quite normal. Million dollars a year as a as a one man shop too, right? So this was when I was because when as a one man shop, I've only worked part time. Okay, but to okay. give you an idea, this month with the twenty second, I have worked less than a day on recruitment this month. And that includes half a day doing all my admin, invoicing, paying my contractors and all that. Yeah. And yet last yeah. year, as a one man shop, I made $220,000. So when I was making over a million, that was when I was doing it full time in an agency. But it was very much you run your desk. We shared the candidates. Okay. We had one central database with all the candidates. But all our business development, all our client contact, 100% independent, really very much. You've got your desk. You do your 360. Okay. For a new business over in the EU, uh, like, is, is, do you think it's different than in the US? Or what do you do for you know, 
you have your your candidates to in placing them in new places like what like i know you haven't done it in a while but like what does it look like over in the eu well very much you need to the the, the agencies that are dominating the market they're on the phone okay so um back back last year when I, when i was working on on launching my training program i joined a number of facebook recruitment groups <laughs> i was amazed that you guys much more prefer text and phone <laughs> you, know, you know i mean it's you know benjamin let me put it this way when i when i first started my boss said to me he first taught me how to source candidates which is the logical first starting point and then once mm-hmm. i knew how to source he said okay this is how you do business development and he said there's one rule and that rule is i will not allow you to call a hiring manager so long you don't have their mobile phone what you guys call a cell phone okay so you can imagine that I mean, first of all, you're quite out of your comfort zone having to get like a highly placed person their cell phone number. And so, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, he taught me and he taught us how to do it. And so to this day, I mean, without a cell phone number, your competition will have it. And therefore, your competition will be there before you. That is for uh, me I'm sure the that big seen- difference. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure you see like some of the stuff in our Facebook groups over here. Like, you know, people that like never pick up the phone or don't want to talk. Or. <laughs> okay. Let me tell you. Let me tell you something. Um, I had so this is a massive, massive, massive French group. They do all sorts of different kinds of engineering. Um, I, I I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of employees they have. So this is a big group. And one of their divisions was doing this project. Now, I was late on this. I was busy with other things, and I'd missed the beginning of this project. And I knew I had to get in here because my competitor had six people working there. And I was like, no, no, this this can't be. So I've got to get in there. (laughs) So talking to candidates, I found out who the hiring manager was. And I started, I got his mobile number, his cell number, and I started calling this guy. I got him on the 106th time I called. (laughs) He he said to me, he said, I don't know who you are, but I see you've tried to call me. You've got five minutes. And yeah, because of having the cell phone number, I finally did manage to get him in the end. And uh, okay, we stayed on the phone for 25 minutes. And within a few months, I had seven people working there. So it worked out. But without a cell phone number, forget it. Forget it. It just, I wouldn't have been doing business. I, I can guarantee you some of the listeners are going to have, like, ask, so the 106 calls, did you leave a voicemail every single time? Oh, no, hardly ever. Or is it just never, 100? Never, 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 never. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. I think I left a voicemail after the fifth or sixth time. And then I left a voicemail maybe after the 20th time. And that's it. Because from the moment okay. that you say who you are, you're losing control. Yeah. Curiosity is gone. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And also, somebody had told me, hide your number when you call. And I did that for about eight months, and it doesn't work. So my number is okay. always visible. Because if your number's hidden, people are going to go, mm, they're trying to sell me something. If your number's not hidden, they're going, oh, well, no, that's, that's probably legitimate. Uh, number hidden here in the states is like a, you're getting an overseas call for the your car warranty or something like that. <laughs> well, exactly. Well, exactly. That's why. Yeah, definitely. Show your number. You've got nothing to hide, right? So you're you're an open, honest business trying to bring an added value. Have your number visible. So, uh, kind of rolling uh, into the like the next one of the next questions I have for you is, uh, you know, what is some of your daily habits to be a successful recruiter over in our top biller over in the EU that, you know, for that space and also like some of those habits that you think could also translate to a lot of the listeners over here in the US? You know, I always say that um, recruitment is one of the most difficult jobs because there are so many different little things that one needs to be good at and control. And so I think that the habits have to be about all these little different things. So, for example, it's about 
your work intensity. The, fir the first three years I was a recruiter, I was working at least 50 to 60 hours a week. And so that would be, I mean, I'm not very good in the morning. So I'd probably start about quarter past nine, 9.30. And <laughs> then I would work easily until seven or eight at night. But then outside of the office and at the weekends, it would be about reading, uh, reading about what's happening in the industry, reading um, on LinkedIn, staying abreast of what people are doing, who's moving where, what's happening, um, just being aware. So you sort of, you, you live your job, you live your market. Um, okay. Now, the other thing is, for me, it's just the, probably the most important is work a niche. And know that niche inside out. As okay. I said earlier, I've got less than 600 candidates. I mean, a lot of them, I wouldn't know, for example, if Canada X, if their wife would be unhappy because I placed them too far away. I wouldn't know if one guy, he had a problem with his kids and therefore he had to work locally and be home every evening. I, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I had a, uh, I had a client. Now, this is a client that didn't have much money. They were, they were completely blocked by, by the hierarchy. And so they didn't have enough money to get decent people on board. Um, and I, I placed one guy there. And, and I mean, I had a really good relationship with the hiring manager. And I said, look, I'm not going to work on this requirement because you just don't have enough money for me. And then, um, I, of course, I followed what was going on. I saw who went there. A guy that I placed many, many times. And after about five weeks, he was gone. And I called the hiring manager and I said, uh, what's happened? <laughs> And he goes, oh, that guy, that, that candidate was a disaster. And I said, well, look, I've placed him about five or six times. He, he's not really a disaster. What happened? He goes, I don't know. It just didn't work. I go, did you let him manage his own time? Did you just l give him free reign to run his thing? And he goes, yeah. And he wasn't capable. I go, no, he's not capable of that. You tell him what to do and he'll do it fantastically. He does it. <laughs> but if he doesn't know what, he's, what is expected of him, he, he, he'll go in all directions and it'll be a nightmare. And now I'm not saying this to boast, but I'm saying this because I think a recruiter should know their candidates to this level of detail. Because if you know your candidate to this level of detail, when you got your client on the phone, you are so tuned in to who's on the market, who's available, that that intake discussion you're having with your, uh, with your hiring manager well, you are guiding it exactly to the matching of their need with who is available. Who can beat that? Uh, probably beats like half the companies here in the US. <laughs> but that's how, that's how you become a top biller. That's awesome. That's, that's, how, great that's, that's, that's one of the things to become a top biller. And there's another thing also, which is, and this was hammered into me. I mean, so much. And it was my boss, my first boss would say this to me in the beginning, 10, 15, 20 times a day, which was right now, what you're doing, will that bring you money this month? And you sort of stop and you think, well, will it make a placement this month? Yes or no? And if it's yes, great, you continue. If it's no, you're thinking, well, yeah. You know, recruitment is all about short term, medium term, long term. But the short term, which is making your placements this month, is so important because that's what is going to pay the bills. That is what is going to pay your salary. So continuously ask yourself, is what I'm doing right now going to bring money in this month? And that should represent probably 70 to 80 percent of your time. And then the rest is, is working on the medium term and the, and, and the long term, which is going to make sure that you always have a pipeline. So long as you always have a pipeline, because I made the mistake once of not having always a pipeline, but so long as you always have a pipeline. <laughs> I think every recruiter's done that though. Oh, that was, you, you know what happened? So I was contacted by this, uh, this uh, organization that I, I, I supplied one division and not the other. And they were launching this new major project. And the, the guy said to me, he said, look, I'm going to have to recruit about seven to nine people. Can you help me? Yes, of course I can help you. I placed 17 people there in a very short period of time. And then I had to manage it because it was continuously moving. And it was a very complicated project. And I got so into it 
that when the project finished, I sort of got up, tried to get some air, and I thought, what's happening in the market? And I didn't know. <laughs> and I was, I, was, I was lost. It took me six months to really get back in and get my figures back up again, you know? When, when, when in a very short period of time, 17 people leave, you can feel that. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I think I think everybody's been in that shoes before. You're like, going good, focused, ah, uh, and then like they, everybody falls off your books, and you're just like, oh, shit. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So you know, it's 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 fascinating because if you look at our jobs, um, I think the the, the difference between a a very average recruiter and and, and a good recruiter is some basic things like intensity, like making sure that you've got the right approach, the right methodology, um, working in each market or not. Um, are you frightened, yes or no, to pick up the phone? Things like that. But a difference in between a good biller, so somebody who will make, let's say, between 100 and 300,000, and somebody who's a top biller and therefore makes you know, way above or above half a million, it's it's those little differentiating factors that mean that you're always on top of your game. And if you can do that, um, well, you're going to be better than the than the competition, and and then you and just, control your market. And just to recap for the, uh, everybody listening, like, what are some of those like to recap the things that uh, you need to be to stay on top of to be a top biller, a big biller? Um, well, definitely intensity. Don't, don't, don't expect in the beginning, don't expect to come in and, and, and do five, six hours work a day. It just, it doesn't work. You need to, to become the number one, the go-to person in your market. Uh, second thing is what you're doing right now. Is it going to, is it going to make you do a placement that month? Um, I mean, my target was always three to four placements a month. It's not huge, but it's enough. I mean, quality placements, which also means that you spend enough time working on getting the margin you want. Um, it's things like knowing your niche and knowing it inside out and controlling it. It's things like making sure that you're on the phone a lot of the time. And it's not only about how many calls you make. It's not only about have you called X amount of, of prospects. Because that's another thing. Um, I would spend 80% of my time talking to candidates. Okay. Um, you know, there's, there's different approaches to recruitment, and I'm, I'm very much a reactive. So most recruiters are proactive. You say, okay, this is my yep. area, this is my niche, I'll go out and present myself to all these prospective clients. But you don't know if they've got a requirement. You don't know what your competition is there. You don't know how important HR is in, in, in the whole thing. But if you actually turn that around and spend all your time talking to candidates, and then you get leads saying, hey, there's a live requirement there, or you see the ads coming. I mean, people who place ads, I love them because they're my pipeline. <laughs> I know there's a live requirement. I haven't placed an ad since 2006. And I see there's a live thing. And because I know my market, often it will say, I need profile, and there'll be, there'll be a description of the profile, and there'll be a town. Now, because I know what is live, I can narrow it down. I might narrow it down to two or three people, HMs that I, that I need to hire, you know? Oh, it's that agent okay. in that company? Well, I know exactly. He is serving this, this, and this, and this client. I, I've got all that. I've got Excel sheets where every single one of my competitors, I know who the client is. Oh, but it wasn't Joe. It was John from that agency. I know that that's different clients. That's the level of knowing your market. And then, of course, what I mean, you do. So real quick, like, like hey, talk of that. That's an incredible market knowledge, like knowing what your competitors are doing and where they're at. Like, that is a level of detail that uh, you typically don't see in the recruiting space that, like, that you're now saying that it has completely set yourself apart, which is phenomenal. Well, it, it's helped me a lot. <laughs> It, it's, it's really because, <laughs> because the, the, I was answering a post the other day where they said the, the question was typically how long does it take you to uh, send CVs to your clients? Now, okay, a lot of it was direct hire, but the approach for staffing and direct hire is the same know your candidates. And 
everybody's saying like, oh, three weeks, two weeks, six weeks. And I said two hours. And everybody's like, what, two hours? But that's it. In an ideal world, one, you only work on live requirements that you get from your candidates. Two, you do some research and you, you call around. You call around to find out who the, the hiring manager is. And then you call all the people who work around the hiring manager and you get information. You get background information. You get to know what the need is. Why is it open? Is it like, for example, somebody going away? Is it somebody being fired? Is it somebody being promoted? Is it a new vacancy? Why is it there? Is it because they've got loads of money and they're growing? They want a big contract? I mean, all that kind of level of detail. And the best one, and this is the absolute best, and it's very difficult to get, but is to know and understand what is the hiring manager being evaluated on and maybe get his bonus on at the end of the year by his or her boss. If you know that, you are bringing a solution to them, which is this person that they need. And if they're being evaluated on, for example, the success of a project, and you're bringing, for example, a project manager in that will make sure that that project is a success, I call, I get the cell number of this unsuspecting prospect who's never heard of me, I know they've got a live requirement. I know everything about it. And I will call and I say, hi, I'm Gavin Johnston. Can we talk? I understand you're looking for such and such a profile. And I actually have a great candidate for you because, of course, I already have spoken to candidates before calling the HM. And that conversation is so targeted on their needs that by the end of that conversation, well, I've got the requirement. And typically, (laughs) I'll send the CV in maybe straight away after the call, or maybe if they were a bit, because sometimes people are freaked out by my knowledge. I mean, I haven't done anything amazing, (laughs) but they're they're, they're a bit freaked out. First of all, I get their cell number, that I did all these things. And then, then I wait one hour, maybe two hours, and then I'll send it in. And then the little trick, and this is a bit naughty, but typically what you do then, you send the mail. You pick up the phone, you call them again, and you say, okay. hi, it's me again. Um, I've just sent you two fantastic candidates for your need. I just want to check that you have received them, that I noted your email down correctly. Often they'll check. They go, yeah, yeah, I've got them. Listen, as I've got you on the phone, can we schedule an interview slot straight away? Because they do have other opportunities that they're looking at, and they're really good. They're just perfect for your requirement. You wouldn't want to lose them. Bang, interview slots organized. It's a bit naughty to push like that, but it works. I mean, I, I mean creating a sense of uh, that you're going to lose this candidate, the position's going to be open longer if you don't move. I mean, that's just uh, smart recruiting 101. Yeah. yeah, but so few people do that because most people are frightened to call straight away. And a lot of people, they'll receive the requirement and they'll put the ad up. But the time for them to write the ad, my guys have already got an interview slot. That's how you become a top biller. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, question for you. I, I, I know it's a, a question that I actually ask everybody. What book that you've read, whether recently or previously, that has the, had the biggest impact on your career? You know, um, it's interesting. I, I read a lot. Um, and... So um, I actually always read two kinds of books. I've got the book at night, which is pleasure something. For example, I've just started a Robert Ludlum. Mm-hmm. But okay. during the day um, or, or, or when I'm running on, 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 on audio books, I like to listen to things that supposedly are going to help me become better. And <clears throat> one, of the, <clears throat> sorry, one of the things that has really, really marked me, I mean, I've read a lot of books that have been very interesting, but one that has really, really marked me is Extreme Ownership. I don't know if you've heard about this. It's um, two army people, uh, what is it, Jocko Billink and and, and Life something. I I can't remember their names, but they're they're, they're um, ex-Navy SEALs, I think. Mm -hmm. And what they teach you, and it's so relevant to recruitment, what they teach you is you've got to have extreme ownership of everything you do. So for example, if you send a candidate in and the client doesn't like it, 
it's not the client's fault. It's your fault. If okay. the client preferred your competition, it's not because of the competition. It's because you didn't do what you had to do. And if you apply on every step of the recruitment way, and actually if you apply it to life in general, having extreme ownership, you're going you're gonna to move a lot of mountains and, and, and you're going to be more successful in life. Awesome. I actually, I have that book. It's on my Audible list. So I literally can't wait to listen to it now. I actually also I uh, listen to audio books while running. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect time. It's like, it's like my little library time as I do a quick little lap around DC. Little so, lap. Uh, uh, it sounds like a very big <laughs> lap. <laughs> it's normally about a little five mile loop I normally do. <laughs> no, that's not bad. Not bad. Yeah. So uh, uh, two more questions for you, and then we'll go ahead and uh, we'll get this wrapped up. First of all, uh, you, I know you mentioned a few times during this, uh, this podcast that you have uh, an online recruiting program coming out. I know it's not out yet, but can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, basically, it's, um, the idea that I had was for years, I, I, I'd heard about uh, blogs and groups that were created to say negative things about recruiters, about how we are <laughs> the worst people in the world and all that. And I thought, hold on a minute. I'm, I'm actually trying here to help people. What, what is wrong with what I'm doing? And then I started reading and hearing the stories about what a lot of recruiters are doing. And I've spoken to quite a few recruiters. And one of the things that I hear is that actually they're very badly trained. It's often not the fault of the recruiter. It's just there isn't a good training out there to really help them from A to Z to know how to be a good recruiter. And so I thought, well, I want to do something else in any case. I might as well capitalize on all my years of recruitment experience and create a training to help people. So not only will it help recruiters, but it will help candidates and it will help clients. And so I'm now waiting for um, there's, there's some technical and legal aspects before I can, I can launch this. It should be launched by the end of the summer. I wish it was faster, but I'm a bit stuck. Um, <laughs> and I need to wait until, uh, until the end of the summer. At the latest, it should be launched by the end of the summer. And the aim is to teach okay, everything that I've learned from people that have trained me and then what I've learned from doing the job for so many years. That, that's exciting, and uh, as soon as it launches again, like we'll, we'll like I'd love to chat with you again about that. Good. And uh, last question before we uh, get this wrapped up, uh, I, you, you've covered a lot of incredible stuff that uh, you know recruiters can do to become a, a top biller, a, a big biller. If you can go back and tell yourself one thing that, like back in your recruiting career, everything that you know now, and like if you can like say one thing to yourself, what would that be to kind of like? help you get to where you want to be quicker it's a very good question um i i think i think the one thing that if you take that as as, as your sort of driving driving approach for for everything you're doing is is that that one thing about is what you're doing right now going to make you money because from the moment you're following that whole approach, everything that you're doing around it will slot in and it, it will make you reflect, am I doing the right thing right now? Is it, is it smart that I'm doing this? Because it's so easy to be distracted. and It's so easy to, to, to stay in your comfort zone. And you say, well, I'm going to talk to that guy because that guy's quite pleasant. But actually, will that guy give me leads? Is that guy looking for work? Is that guy actually going to bring me anything that's going to help me make a placement this month? Probably not. Okay, let's get out of our comfort zone and go where we need to be to make that, that deal. Okay, awesome. Phenomenal. I am so excited about this uh, going live and everybody hearing and learning from it. Also, it's been exciting, you know, uh, learning a little more about recruiting over in the e EU. I know the fundamentals are the same, but I know you're handling different challenges out there. So Gavin, just want to say thank you for coming on the podcast. To the listeners, I look forward to having you guys listen in to this one and the future podcast that we have. Thank you very much, Benjamin. It's been great. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Elite Recruiter Podcast with Benjamin Mena. If you enjoyed, hit subscribe and leave a rating. 